Welcome to Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. Adrian Fries and Trey Bailey invite you to join them on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as we participate in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. St. John Chrysostom once said, having children is a matter of nature, but raising them and educating them in the virtues is a matter of mind and will. John, we're so glad to have you in this conversation today. And being the father of 11 children, I'm sure that this quote has some special meaning to you. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so thanks for having me this morning. Um, you know, I, I think that one of, the, uh, one of the challenges that parents face today is this idea of raising good kids. Um, and, you know, in my, in my life, both as a father and as a headmaster, you know, I get to see the the best and worst of of human nature, and one of the things that I think is is most challenging is actually getting parents to be parents today. Um, and and this I think will will kind of segue into our discussion, you know, here and a little bit about talking about history and about leading schools and all those different types of things. But it will be, um, you know. It's it's interesting because we we have to be cognizant of our responsibilities as parents. We have to be cognizant of um, you know raising up our children and, and making them God fearing and not being their buddy. And you know, as as I've grown older, you know, I, I always wanted to be the parent who was the cool parent, and I always wanted to say yes to my kids and you know, that, that only lasts for so long that, you know, when we're talking about virtue, we're talking about raising children. It is something which requires, at certain times, it requires a, a lot of uh, kind of brute um, reality coming coming from the parent and, and the child being, you know, humble and docile enough to, to accept those things. So, you know, St. John Chrysostom's quote there, he, he has a, a, a text on vainglory and the upbringing of children. And that's really the kind of the basis for um, a lot of those, a lot of those feelings and a lot of those sayings that he has on that, you know, that we have a, a moral responsibility to, um, to rear our children in virtue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, John, that, that's really great. That quote um, hits on a lot of really deep things. Like you could expand on it in a lot of ways. And what I'd like to hear from you is how, how that quote in particular, maybe you could read it again, how in particular it has shaped you as a headmaster. Okay. Um, do you want to read it or do you want me to? Would you read it, please? Sure. Having children is a matter of nature, but raising them and educating them in the virtues is a matter of mind and will. Yeah, so... You know, one of the things that headmasters do is they, you know, they're they're both um, they're they're both teacher and psychologist, and um, you know, we can see things in children oftentimes before parents do, because children behave one way at home, they behave another way at school, and at the root of it is the will. The will of the child is what has to be formed. Now, as Orthodox Christians, you know, we we talk about the 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 formation of the mind, the heart, and the will. But that that component of the will of the child is is what is most um reticent of the fall. Whenever we look at a kid, we can say, Yeah, there's no doubt that human nature has fallen. You can just look at a first grader or a second grader, you know, on a on a playground or in the lunchroom or this, that, or the other thing, and it is very, very apparent. So as a headmaster, one of my jobs is not just to teach kids, you know, their phonics and their phonemes and their numeracy and all these different things, but also to get them to 
understand themselves in a real and substantive way. And that way is often in them getting to recognize that their will has to be has to be molded and has to be formed. Hmm. Now, John, you have 11 children of your own, correct? Yes. And so some of the things you mentioned, I think that, you know, educators and administrators working in classical education, um, you know, we, we would be in full agreement that that is, you know, in large part our job, you know, when we go to work uh, at these schools, um, we have those responsibilities put upon us. Um, and there's, there's a, there's a well-known proverb, um, and I, I can't recall who said it, but the idea is that uh, the cobbler's children has no shoes. Right. I just wonder, um, as a teacher myself, sometimes I worry about this. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking and preparing to uh, help and, and uh, instruct uh, other people's children. And then you come home and you're tired and uh, you, know, you, you sometimes don't approach um, the teaching of your own children perhaps with the same sort of vigor that you do when you get up and you head off to work in the morning. Um, right. Have, have you had any, any experiences like that in your own life? And how have you found working in classical education to shape and form the way you, you teach your children as a father? Yeah, I think that uh, for me, it was waking up one day and realizing that my job as a headmaster and my role in, in um, vocation as a parent were not two separate things that they were really two halves of the same whole. Um, I mean, I'm not ashamed to admit, I've, I've confessed this multiple times, but you know, one of the things I struggle with is patience for my children. Mm -hmm. And um, I, can be, I can be super, super patient with somebody else's kids, but with my own, um, I, I, tend to, um, expect, um, I tend to expect more out of them. And um, it's actually my, my wife who is, uh, who is this uh, fellow traveler with me and, and raising these children um, that points out to me sometimes brutally, look, th they're kids, they're, you know, and you have to give the best of yourself to them, just like you give the best of yourself to your, to your students. That has been a process of, of um, sometimes painful discovery as I've grown old and as I've become, you know, who, um, who I'm supposed to be. Um, I mean, we, we make fun of people who sit there and say, you know, I just need to go and find myself. But as an Orthodox Christian, it's a constant daily realization of your insufficiencies. And with humility, um, that's how you can, you can start to, to kind of build upon those things. Um, I've also noticed that it's very, very difficult for me to teach my own kids. Um, and I, you know, I can sit in a, in a room full of students and, and talk about Plato's Republic and, you know, how the cave analogy is, is, is important today. Um, but I, I have difficulty doing that same thing with my own kids. So what we often do, and I think Adrian can attest to this is that, you know, dinner table um, conversations are, are, are those teaching moments. And we, we tend to let the kids bring up conversations and, um, you know, have those difficult, difficult discussions, um, oftentimes around, around the dinner table. So, um, yes, it, it is, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, it's a, it's a vocation that, you know, you're constantly striving to improve and constantly striving to work better towards. Um, but it's not something that you just wake up one day and say, I've got this, um, because, you know, on, on the whole of it, we really don't ever have it. You know, even when, when we, when we die, we're only going to have attained a, a you know, a glimmer of kind of our full, um, our full potentiality, our full, um, humanness. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, we see the faults of ourselves and other people. We will criticize, you know, somebody who, who eats too much because we eat too much or because somebody who smokes because we smoke. Um, and it's the same thing I think with raising kids that, you know, you recognize where you as a human being have falled and, and failed, sorry. Um, and you want to root that out as quickly as possible because none of us wants our kids to go through life 
you know, struggling with the things that we struggle with. And we think that, you know, if we're, if we're, you know, hard on them, get them to, um, to recognize these things earlier, that they'll somehow be able to overcome it quicker. And that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, John. So, so there's, there's a lot in there. Um, I guess one of the things that I feel like you could really offer our audience in what you just said is how, how do you help parents in your schools? Cause I, I know in the work we've done for many years with, with classical education, parents, um, if, especially if they're new to classical education, really struggle with, with this kind of different way of teaching because it really does hit the heart of what it is to be a human being. And, and when you're talking about shaping the will and forming virtue in the hearts of students, you're teaching very differently. And a lot of parents come into this as their first time ever experiencing this, and they have completely different expectations, um, perhaps than than they would if their kids were in a public school. And I'm just curious, like, how do you how do you help those parents? I think that the first thing that you have to do is you have to get parents to understand that um, it is not it's not about them. You know, when we're, we're all born as as you know, kind of selfish individuals, and part of our you know formation as human beings, part of our fully becoming as Christ is to recognize that we are not just individuals. In fact, we're part of a community. And parents don't understand this. You know, parents are were children at one time, and and oftentimes today, you know, people want to have their egos, you know, stoked. They want to be told how good they are, and they, you know, we tell our kids, you know, go out there and be the best that you can be, and you know, be number one in your class and be number one on the sports team. And young parents, especially unless they unless they have been raised very very well. Um, and come into um, this community of people, and they're selfish. And part of that of that training, part of that understanding, is that they have to first recognize that they're selfish, because they cannot seek the the good, the beautiful, and the true. They cannot seek what's good for others um, until they recognize that. So when I'm working with parents, you know, I always tell my parents at the first parent info meeting, you know, when I call you to tell you that Johnny is getting suspended, I'm not calling necessarily to criticize your parenting skills. Um, because parents, most parents are doing the best that they can. It's not their fault necessarily that they make these decisions. They're only doing what they know how to do. And let's just face it. There's no handbook on how to be a parent. There's no handbook on on you know you do these this for here's the formula it's kind of like a um, the distributed property if you if you do this formula with this problem it will work and that's not life life is um, you know ninety percent uh, just you know gut instinct and the other ten percent is is knowledge and experience so you have to be patient with them but you you have to get them to have that realization that. You know, it's not about them that when they have this community, that it is it is about the good for the community. And sometimes that's recognizing that, you know, this thing that Johnny is doing in school, it's really my fault. You know, Johnny, um, you know, Johnny stole something from uh, from a kid at lunch today. Well, you know, uh, it could be because Johnny doesn't see dad being honest whenever dad goes to the supermarket and doesn't, he's giving back a dollar and extra and change and he keeps that dollar. Or he doesn't, he doesn't set that example. So, you know, it is, it's hard. And it's, you know, initially in my, in my career as a headmaster, it was very frustrating because it was so obvious to me. You know, I, I would want to look at parents and say, the problem is not necessarily that your son or your daughter are doing these things. The problem is, is that you don't have the humility to recognize that they're kids and that this is a, this is a, a community problem. This is not just their problem. So you have to get them to understand those things. You have to, 
um, you have to lead with humility. And when you do that, wonderful things happen, you know, and you can have some very hard conversations with parents and if parents don't think that you're attacking them. If you're really coming at it from a, from a place of love, um, they, they, they will follow you. They will push back and they will have their opinions and their opinions are just as important as your opinions. Um, but at the end of the day, you both want what's best for that child. And, you know, classical education does a beautiful thing, a beautiful job of doing that. Because the, the, there are principles in the classroom which dictate how we behave. And it's not just a free-for-all. You know, when, when we talk about free thinking, we're not, we're not saying that we don't use anything to inform ourselves. We only form our own opinions. No, that's, that's not right. It's that we have read as much as we can. And from those things, then we form our own informed decision about things. Um, we mentioned there's the principles in the classroom in a classical education are different. Um, how, how, how would you explain to somebody new to classical education that it's different than, say, uh, the progressive education in the world today? Yeah, because it's, it's not, you know, what we're learning in a classical school uh, is 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 really kind of a, a, a conglomeration of things. It's it's learning how to think, it's learning content, um, and it's learning how to apply that content with thinking to a particular situation. So, you know, anybody can go in and learn how to build a, a desk. You know, you teach children how to measure and how to cut wood and how to hammer something. They can do that, um, but. It is eminently much more uh, important if they can understand why you measure before you cut and why you cut before you hammer and why you use this type of tack instead of this type of nail. Um, so in a classical education, it's not just about memorizing a bunch of facts. I mean, you can have someone who knows a lot of things but doesn't really have any substance or any you know any moral compass to be able to apply those things so with classical education it is yes it is learning those facts it's it's learning you know all this different content but it more importantly it's 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 applying that content and being able to recognize in a piece of literature when somebody has done something that's not virtuous and being able to recognize that, you know, like in Madame Bovary, what is the moral of Madame Bovary? Sin leads to death, period. Um, and, you know, that may be unpopular today. People don't want to call sin, sin. But that doesn't take away the eternal truth that there are things that are objectively evil. And we do not do those things because they will end in death. Yeah, John, I wonder if there's another piece to this puzzle that could help us out here, which is that, you know, any type of school is going to have, you know, a focus on content and is going to have certain methods as to how a, you know, a child will, will learn that content, certain uh, approaches that teachers have to deliver and instruct that content. And it seems to me that one of the things that a, uh, a classical Christian school tries to do is concern itself with not only the content, but also um, who you are while you are in the process of learning that content, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm reminded of uh, Simone Weil's essay on, um, on learning, and she, she talks about what she calls forming the habit of attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're working on a math problem, uh, that difficult work of trying to solve the problem even if you get the problem wrong, or even if you struggle for a long time to get the answer right, that habit of attention that you're developing in the process will bear fruit in your life. And she says it ultimately will bear fruit in prayer. And so what that tells me is that um, the type of education that, that, you are, um, that you're promoting and, and, and working in is one that tries to think about a a bigger picture than just what's going on in the classroom. Um, you want the student to, to be and to 
become a certain type of person. Now, of course, you know, a teacher only has them for so long during the course of a day. Mm -hmm. And so it seems uh, that it would be necessary for, in order for a classical school to, to work fully, um, it seems necessary that there be a, a home that is on the same sheet of music, so to speak. Yes. Uh, that is working, um, you know, like a, uh, you know, all the pistons are firing <laughs> in the right order, so to speak. And so um, I guess to, to turn our conversation back to helping parents, um, in some sense, I think what, what we've learned over the, you know, the last few decades of classical education being sort of reborn in this country, um, it's more of an education of the family than it is just the education of the individual student, wouldn't you say? Uh, I think that that's partially true. Uh, you know, I just recently saw uh, a meme and it was two gentlemen, one in a suit and one sitting basically in a, in a street, you know, on a street corner. Um, the man in the suit, you know, had his briefcase. The man sitting on the street corner had a bottle of booze in his hand. And the caption said, how did you become who you are? And the man in the suit said, because my dad was an alcoholic. And the person who was sitting on the street who was an alcoholic said, because my dad was an alcoholic. They're both brothers. I think that that is, is very, very true. There, there is a point where when children are young, um, that buy-in and that support from families is very, very, very important. But something magical happens when a child, you know, goes to middle school, that they're not quite adults, they're not quite able to form all those opinions and all those to, to make those definitive decisions about something. But they're starting to make those decisions. It's why it's so important for parents to be super, super strong for the first 12 years of a child's life, because that will be the foundation upon which the child builds their life together. So yes, in, in one instance, you have to have complete, absolute buy-in, absolute support from parents. They may not always understand what those things are, but as long as they are supportive of the program, you're going to be able to do good things and you're going to be able to get that child to where they need to be, you know, quicker. But even when you don't have parental support and look, I've led some very large schools. Um, the parent community that I'm working with here is phenomenal. The parent community that I worked with in Texas was phenomenal, but you still had outliers. You still had parents who didn't want to be parents. And yet in spite of that, what the kids were learning, in spite of what they were not getting at home, they were able to be given tools upon which they could start to make their own decisions. And nine times out of 10, those decisions were good decisions. Um, so while the school never, ever replaces the family, in some instance, the school, the headmaster, the teachers, um, if they are God-fearing, you know, Christian souls who, who love their, their students and love their craft, um, they can help a student who may be in a situation where they're not getting as much parental support at home. And that's why it's, it's, it's important, you know, when, when we're talking about these things, that the, the goal is virtue, as St. John Chrysostom said, it's forming the will. And sometimes, you know, when you don't get that parent buy-in, um, as long as the faculty is strong and the, the families are strong, you're able to, um, to, to get that child to where they need to be. Mm -hmm. So speaking of the will, I'm, I'm reminded of something that I, I think Beatrice said uh, in, in the Divine Comedy, and that is that if the will won't will, nothing can force it. Mm. Uh, what, do you, what do you do when you have a student who just doesn't have the will to do what what they ought to do, what he or she ought to do. You have to exercise extreme patience. And this is the, if there's a great line from a movie, you know, it is my will against yours and you will lose. 
Um, and with a child, you can't do that. It's not, you know, if you push your, you know, you push your will upon a child, the child, they're instrangent. They're not going to move from that. You have to, you have to encourage them along, excuse me, in a way in which they think it's their idea or their own, you know, their own determination to do those things. And sometimes that takes years. Um, I had a, a student at my former school who was, you know, bullying another student. And, you know, I brought the kid in. He had been in trouble. And I looked at him and I said, you know, what's the deal here? And he shared something very private with me. And I said, look, this is the issue. The issue is not that you're a bad kid. The issue is, is that you're really upset about this other thing. And you've never dealt with that. You know, kids, kids are not mean by nature. Mean, you know, being mean is something which is a learned behavior. Most children, if they are well loved and they are brought up to be respectful, will continue those things. So it's it's getting at the heart of what is the problem. Is it is it really just that this kid is instringent and not wanting to to work with you? Or is there something, you know, deeper that parents have to come together and you know sometimes parents are clueless and that's okay um there are many times in my life where i have been a clueless parent it's something just caught me you know out of left field um and that's where we you know going back to what i said about humility that's where you have to go back to humility and say you know i i did not understand this you know this is this is on me or I could have done better in this particular situation. So it's patience, it's love, it, but it's also being, you know, as a campus leader, as a headmaster, uh, being able to zero in on what the issue is because a kid who's just refusing to do something, there's a reason why they're refusing to do it. And it's not always because, well, they're just a kid who needs to be formed. Yeah, that's really good, John. Um, do you have any stories in your years of, um either teaching or being a headmaster that stand out to you that you think our listeners would be encouraged to hear? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so the first school that I ever led, um, I was in Southeast Dallas. Um, it was a um, economically disadvantaged group of kids. Um, I would say we probably were 70% Hispanic, 25% African American and then 5%, you know, um Caucasian. Um English was a um was a, 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 a it was just not something which was familiar even to the kids who were raised in English speaking households. Um I had a third grade student who had only been in the United States for two and a half months before she came to the school. And she came up to her teacher at the end of the year. I'll never forget it. And she said, I've learned all my phonemes and I've learned all my phonograms. And she said, and my mama, who doesn't speak very good English, has also learned her phonemes and her phonograms by practicing with me every night. And this third grader, again, her English is... Uh, is just it's developing but that was that was significant a the program works and b the child who was afraid of their own shadow when they showed up to the school um you know had made some significant improvements in a very very short amount of time um so that is one that sticks out to me from from east dallas um, I had, um, uh, I had a young man who fifth grade boy, um, you know, got into a, an argument with a kid the first day of school. He ended up picking up the kid by the throat and telling him he was going to murder him. And I brought him into my office and he kind of paced back and forth like a bull in my, in my office. And I said, you need to sit down. And he goes, Mr. Heitzreiter. I'm going to beat you up. 
and he kind of cracked his neck. And I thought to myself, this fifth grade boy could probably take me. He was a big kid. He was angry. And I sat him down and I said, you know, what, what's the, what's the issue? And he had just found out that his mom was, was dying of cancer and his dad was in jail. Hmm. And then he cried and I cried and we called his mom. She came in and I sat down with her and she cried. She told us about, you know, going through the chemotherapy and how he was a, just an angry kid. And I said, you know, I have to suspend him because he got into a fight and he threatened me. I said, but he comes back in three days. I said, and, and we're going to work with him. And he came back three days later and he was my best student the, the rest of that year. Um, you know, so th these things work. At the end of the day, it's not always about just putting tons of information into a child's brain. Sometimes it's just about being human with the child and recognizing that, especially today, our kids, um, you know, they've got some real difficult things. They, it's the most stressed out generation in the history of the world. Our, our grandparents who went through World War II were not as stressed out as these kids are. And I think it's a combination of social media. I think it's uh, a combination of living very kind of one-dimensional lives. We, we, we sit on our telephones. Our kids, you know, when I was a kid, we would go to the neighbor, neighbor kid's house and we'd go ride our bikes and we would go play in the neighborhood. We didn't have phones that were distracting us. We didn't have Instagram. We didn't have social media where people were talking bad about us online. Um, you know, it's, it's just a different world. So we have to, um, we have to love kids and we have to be good to them and we have to be good to their parents because some of their parents are just kids themselves. Um, and I don't know when it was in my career that I realized that, you know, I was now the oldest person in the community. Um, but that's, you talk about kind of a, a culture shock, you know, oh. as a teacher starting out, I was, you know, one of the young guys. And then now I look back and I have parents that are just starting to have children, you know, they're in their early twenties and I'm in my mid forties, right? you know, so that's, that's an interesting um, caveat there. Yeah, John, you, you, you brought up technology, which I think we should come back to. Um, and I do. I do want to ask you about um, discipline as well, because that came up in your story. Um, perhaps I'll take the discipline issue first and then um, we'll come back around to technology. So in the story that you told, you know, you have a young man who's, who's clearly struggling with some really heavy things, and yet you saw it uh, to be good and right to, uh, to still discipline him. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes, um, uh, you know, one of the contemporary approaches is, well, if we just, um, you know, we'll sort of, uh, you know, not, not, uh, you know, not be too heavy on, heavy handed on the discipline. Um, and if we just listen to kids and if we just, um, which you did, but, but you also followed up with the discipline. Why, why did you sense that that was necessary? And, and do you have anything to say about the role of discipline in classical education? Yeah, so um, I think the discipline is very important. I think that, you know, it's kind of a, a, a training for life, if you want to call it that. You know, there, actions have consequences, you know. And you can always scale back on a consequence, especially for a kid who, you know, if somebody comes out of left field and, you know, it's like, where did that come from, right? Um, but th there has to be, a, there, there's always a cause and effect relationship with, with things. And children want to be held accountable. They may tell you that they don't want to be, hmm. but they want to be held accountable. They, you know, I, I always tell my faculty that we have to be the example in the classroom. But more importantly, we have to be the example outside of the classroom because children can smell hypocrisy from a mile away. You know, if we talk goodness, truth, and beauty, and then, you know, we're, you know, arrested for a DWI or we're seen, um, you know, yelling at somebody at a restaurant, 
you know, that for a child, you have lost all credibility with them at that point. Right. But when you, as the, um, as the, as the teacher, when you, as the, as the headmaster are saying, yes, I understand that this happened. It's terrible that it happened to you. And we're going to continue to work with you to help you get through that. But the consequence for this thing, there is a consequence for this thing. They are not, I, I don't think I've ever had a child who I've given a consequence to that has just rebelled and said, that's just stupid. I'm not going to do that. They understand that, you know, and they're oftentimes they're doing these things because they want that consequence because sometimes negative uh, attention is better than no attention at all. You know, so in a, in a classical school, you know, discipline should never be demoralizing. <laughs> there should always be a purpose for it. And I hate making kids write lines. I don't ever make children write lines. I'm not going to hand a kid a Bible and tell them to write, you know, the first, you know, 50 chapters of, of Genesis. Why? Because they'll never pick up the Bible again and never read it. You don't, you don't, the, you know, punching a kid, getting into a fight and being suspended. It's a logical consequence of that, you know, but getting into, uh, you know, uh, talking back to the teacher and making the child write 50 lines. I'm just not a huge, huge, huge fan of, I think it's, it's completely counterproductive. So it has to be, it has to be commensurate with what the child did. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's important that a child receive the consequence, but then be brought back into the community. I mean, when we sin, we confess our sins. Sometimes there's an epitemia. Sometimes there's a, a greater consequence to that sin, but we fulfill our penance and then we're brought back into the community. Right. You know, the priest doesn't look at us and say, uh, you know, you did that thing. I know that you did that thing. And even though you've done your penance, you know, you're still, I, I'm still looking at you like cross-eyed and you know, you're this terrible human being. No, we do our penance and we're brought back into the community. That's the way that it should be. Yeah, John, that's right. John, how do you how do you deal with parents that are maybe upset with you because of the? I know that oh, working with so many headmasters in the last seven years, I've heard so many stories of uh, headmasters feel so frustrated often because of you know helicopter parenting and the parents who really you know get upset when you're disciplining their their student, and I'm sure that's happened to you. How do you deal with that? Um, I try to, I always try to meet more than halfway with a family. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not always able to do that, then, then we have to, to agree to disagree. Um, I've had parents come in and, you know, bang their fists on my table and call me every name in the book. And I just remain patient and say, I understand that you're upset. However, you know, this is the, the the child did do this. Well, my child wouldn't do that. No, your child did do this, and it's it's okay. I mean, it's a bad thing that they did, but it's okay. This is this is not out of their not out of line for a child to do something like this. Um, you know, and there are other times where I've had to be a little bit more than just kind and 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 say, look, you know, outside of this school. I'm just as ordinary as everybody else, but inside the school, I am the law. It's my job to protect every student here, including their students and their children, you know, and I always have a rule with my teachers. You know, there is no special treatment for my children, period. Mm -hmm. If my child does something, they get the consequence just like any other kid. And when parents see that my kids are held to the same standard, it is almost like, like the, everything just kind of smooths out over that over that time. And I'll tell parents, you know, if my kid did this, I would I would expel them. Um, you know, and a uh, funny little little story. My first uh, my first week back, um, so I had led a school, and then I went to the uh, responsive ed corporate offices and was a content director. Um, and then uh, a big school came open and I went to go lead that school. And my daughter, Mary, was sitting in the lunchroom and there was a volunteer who was walking around and my daughter held up her bowl of pasta. And she sat there and she shook it. And the volunteer says, 
can I help you? And she says, yes, heat this up. And the volunteer <laughs> said, is there anything else that you want to say? And Mary goes, my daddy's the headmaster. Ooh. And she looked at her and she said, I don't care who your dad is. You are being very disrespectful. Well, when I found out about that, she was <laughs> the first child that I gave a conduct referral and a detention to at that school. <laughs> my own kid. Uh, and of course, and, I'm sure, of course it was Mary. Of like, course it was Mary. <laughs> but she never forgot that. Uh, and she never, she never forgot that. You have to be kind to everyone. Even the lady who's volunteering, even the lady who you don't see every day, um, and you never ever pull rank with anybody. Mm. I don't think I can. I can think of maybe one time in my entire career as a headmaster where I've looked at a parent and said, "I'm the headmaster. This is the final decision, and you have no further say in this." And it was a very, very, very serious situation um, that the superintendent ended up backing me up on because it was it was such a serious thing um and you know even after that you know the parents were initially upset but they went home they cooled down they thought about it and uh we were able to come to to a a, a mutually beneficial agreement for everyone involved um so yes parents can be difficult but it's i always say that it's coming from a place of love it's coming from a place of love or a place of ignorance. You know, parents don't want to want to recognize that their child is capable of doing really terrible things. I've been there, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's, again, that goes back to that humility. We have to have the humility to understand that our children are not perfect. And look, I, I have been a terrible parent in some of the things that, you know, in the way that I've raised my kids sometimes. Um, and, I would, you know, I, I asked for their forgiveness, you know, more than, more than I probably, you know, even should sometimes, um, because we, we're all growing. We're all students in some respect. We're all still learning. Um, and you just have to lead with humility. Yeah. John, I appreciate you sharing those stories. I know that, um, there's probably a unique challenge that, well, teachers uh, and administrators both face when when their own child or children are a part of the school, um, you know, because that child is used to um, having access to you in a way um, at home that, you know, may not be appropriate uh, in the school setting, um, you know, to, to come to you, um, you know, with, uh, you know, with with certain requests or with certain needs. Um, that you know you would meet uh, in the home that um you know as your role as headmaster um you know it would it would uh perhaps give the appearance of favoritism um if they were to do that at school so how do you i'm i'm trying to think about how you just manage that on a day-to-day -day basis do you have any certain um is, is there any sort of uh policies that you have between you and your children um, as far as sort of everyday life at school? Yeah. So for, for my teachers, I always tell, I always tell my teachers that, I mean, the, the situation that I described with Mary was, uh, was an outlier in the sense that, um, I took, I took the, the bull by the horns on that. And I, I administered the consequence on that. Usually if my children act up at school, the rule was, is that the teachers called my wife and they they dealt with that i would always if, if it was a conduct referral um or a matter of discipline you know i would recuse myself most of the time if it involved my own kid uh -huh. um it's just to be to, to to be very circumspect and to, to you know because i had i had a staff that was completely capable of administering the consequence sure. there were instances where uh, my kids would come to me at home and say, you know, Papa, is there anything that you can do to help with this? And I would immediately look at them and say, you need to go and advocate for yourself. Um, you know, I, I'm someday I'm going to be I'm going to be in the ground. I'm going to be plant food. And if you don't learn how to advocate for yourself now, uh -huh. you're never going to learn that. Uh -huh. um, and and sometimes that's from a very young age. I mean, I, I think that um, my son Thomas. 
uh, had a wonderful teacher at Founders, um, but he, you know, he got called out for something that he didn't think was right. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, can you talk to the teacher, Papa? And I said, no. So but you can go and talk to the teacher. And he kind of looked at me, and Thomas is this very kind of meek, um, mild, very, very well-behaved young man. And he was terrified. And I said, you have to do it. You, you have to have the courage to go in there mm-hmm. and say, you know, ma'am, I don't think that this was right, but I still accept the consequence if that's if you if you if you think that this is, you know, can can I can I please explain myself to you? And it was so good for him to do that. He came home and he looked at me and he said, Papa, I did it. And I said, so she like reversed the consequence. And he said, no, she made me still accountable for what I did. But now I understand why it upset her. And now I know that I can always go back to her and tell her if something is bothering me. Um, So that's if you if you are a school leader and you've got kids in the school, make them advocate for themselves. Mm-hmm. If there's a discipline problem, um, have your have your spouse be involved. Have them be the one that gets the phone call, especially if a kid's going to get suspended for something. I mean, God forbid, you know, it's always the preacher's kids and the headmaster's kids that get in trouble, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so just being able to get them to um, to be fair. Right. Because I don't ever, I don't ever pull rank with my kids. In fact, I will always err on the side of I'm never gonna. In most instances, I will always side on the side of the teacher over my child. Um, yeah, and you know, parents don't like that. Sometimes they don't like to hear that. Well, you should be fighting for your kids. No, my kids are little pukes sometimes, just like everybody else's kids. Mm-hmm. You know, John, I'm curious, how old was Thomas when he did that? He was in first grade. Wow. Yeah, first, first, just, I think it was, it may have been second grade, but I think it was first grade. Yeah. yeah. And you know, Thomas, Thomas is just, oh, yeah. he's going to be a professor someday. I, I see him yeah. like living in Princeton Library just with books surrounding himself about dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, uh, about dinosaurs, right. <laughs> He'll be an archaeologist, a dinosaur digger. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's really excellent advice. And um, we could probably have a whole conversation just focused on, um, sort of the the ins and outs of uh, of just just having your own children in the school setting. <laughs> yeah, uh, I feel like that there, there's there's probably uh, an audience for that. Um, this is something that teachers and administrators um, you know work with every day, um, especially because schools are oftentimes started with the you know the children of the teachers right who come together to form a school. So that, that's, that's a major uh, and an, an important topic. I want to go back to this question of technology because I think, I think you're exactly right to, to notice it and to identify it as one of the major factors among several that are affecting um, you know, the hearts and minds of, of children, but also of their families. One of the things that I noticed in the lives of my own students is that the younger the students were, um, you know, they, they were playing video games, you know, from, from you know, uh, kindergarten up through, you know, uh, 12th grade and beyond. Mm-hmm. But what I noticed was that the younger the students were, the more likely it was that their father also played video games. And the younger they were, the more uh, their father played those games. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, and and perhaps you've noticed something similar. So so, you know, uh, for for your you know for your uh, college age students, you know, they can still somewhat remember, you know, uh, a home life in which you know, video games was just something that that they did. But anymore, uh, this is something that dad does too. Right. And so I just wonder how how do you uh, how do you talk to your students about technology when it's something that is so um, uh, just a part of the the household uh, at large? Yeah, so it's interesting. I, yeah, I have a I have a term for this, and I I don't know if if I'm the only one that has ever used this term, but I, I refer to this to, to this group of, of parents in particular as the the Nintendo generation. Uh-huh. Um, you know, there there were there were two types of kids when I was growing up. There was the 
kids who had Nintendo and the kids who could not afford Nintendo. Right. Um, and I'll never forget. I think I was probably eleven when my when I we got a Nintendo and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. My dad thought it was the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> um, and you know what I what I try to teach my my students and my and my children is that technology is a tool. Um, it's a tool which can be used for good or bad, but it's not something our lives are not supposed to be, um, you know, focused on technology. It, it is, it is something which is there to, to aid us. And look, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not of the opinion as an educator that a child should never play a video game or, um, that they should never use a computer. Um, but you know, I do think that it's important that they learn how to use those things in the proper context. Um, if you've got a parent who is the Nintendo generation parent, it's it's almost impossible. It's like telling a dad that he can't watch, you know, a football game on a Sunday. Sure. Um, it's, it's extremely difficult. Um, so what you have to do is you have to just you know, pour into the student, you know, the, into the student's mind that it's a tool, it's a tool, it's a tool. Um, and it's something which has to be used within a proper context. And those are battles that, um, you know, my big thing is social media. I mean, which Nintendo was just a, a, a stepping stone. You know, if you really look back on it, it was just a stepping stone to Facebook and all these different things. Um, because it's engaging a world which appears to be real, but is absolutely not real. Absolutely. It's something which takes you out of your kind of normal, um, normal kind of scope of reality and puts you in an alternate reality. Uh -huh. um, and that is, that's terrifying. I mean, we all use social media. We use Facebook. We, you know, we like it when somebody hearts our, our comment and, you know, somebody gives us a smiley face emoji. It makes us feel good. Uh -huh. um, but it's, it's just, a, it's like, it's like a domino. The domino is just kind of being pushed into the first set of dominoes. And I don't think that we can see down the domino path, how that's going to expand, but it is, it is terrifying because we're starting, you know, we're starting to really identify with how we appear virtually. And I think, I mean, we can come back to this on another episode, but that virtual reality is something which is going to, it's going to doom our civilization, which is why books are so important. Um, it's why, you know, this whole online, online learning, it was necessary for like two months, but bring our kids back, put them in the classroom because it's, this is not, we are, we are, we are created to interact with humans. We are created to have conversations. We are created for a community. And a computer is not part of that community. Now, as I said, it's a tool and you just have to, the parents aren't going to listen. Then you just have to focus on, on, you know, getting the child to recognize that because here's the thing. Every time that they sit down to play that game, if you have done what you're supposed to do, they're always going to sit there and say, you know, Mr. Heisberg said that this is just a tool and, you know, maybe I should not play this all day long. Maybe I should just go out and, and um, you know, run around and play on my bike and actually engage with human beings. Um, but that's that. I I don't I don't have a specific answer for that. I just I just know that, you know, it, you, you have a very very difficult road to hoe with the Nintendo parents who, that's all that they do. They're they're they go to work, they come home, and they game. There's absolutely no interaction. They don't eat dinner together. They you know, the, the parents go and they eat dinner in their bedroom. The kids are grabbing a, a hot pocket and putting it in the microwave. I mean, it's just, it's terrible. And it's, it's something that, you know, we're going to have to, as a civilization, there, there will be a day of reckoning. And I'm afraid that it will come sooner rather than later. Well, I'm sure you're quite right, John. And it seems to me that um, perhaps this is where uh, the school can, can set a good example. You know, the teacher, uh, can be perhaps the one adult in the life of, of a student that is not seen constantly on a device. 
Um, I mean, I, I became aware of this myself, and I had to kick my smartphone uh, to the curb because, um, you know, I found myself um, in between classes or, um, you know, uh, at lunch, you know, being drawn to this thing. It's such an addictive, um, you know, uh, part of our, uh, you know, everyday uh, routine. And I just became aware of these little eyes that were watching me do this and yep. whether whether or not they knew what I was doing on it or not. Right. Um, you know, I could have been um, I could have been lesson planning on my phone for that matter. But that's sort of beside the point um, because they're they're just seeing, um, uh, again, an adult who, you know, um, is being constantly captivated by the screen. And and I just wonder. Um, you know, how, how can teachers, um, well, how can headmasters perhaps make it so that their teachers are less tied to, to technology um, during the course of the day than they perhaps have been? Because schools are, if anything, trying to bring more technology into the classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know? yeah, I think that, um, I mean, I, I would suggest maybe we, we come back and have a, a, a full discussion on this, but here's, here's my thought. And that is, as a campus, the campus leader, you make it so that there's as much human interaction on a minute by minute basis with students as possible. So things like attendance taking, you know, do the traditional attendance taking that teachers can put in their computers later on. You know, sure. all of us had a grade book as, as young teachers. There was none of this electronic grade book stuff. Um, I mean, that's one possibility. Sometimes you're, you know, you're not in a system where that's possible. Um, again, using it as a tool uh, and then getting right back to it. Um, and then limiting the, um, the amount of smells and bells that, uh, you know, yes, we have to do nature study and we have to do picture studies and those things, it's very easy to bring those up on our computer and we should yeah. use computers for that. But also taking the opportunity to get kids outside and taking them to an art museum and seeing the real thing. Um, I mean, how many of us take pictures with our phones because we want to capture a moment and we've lost the moment? Right. The picture, the picture's not the moment; it's mm -hmm. gone. That's right. You know, um, and I, I'm, I'm guilty of this just as much as anybody else. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, we just, I think it's baby steps. I think that we we have to we have to to realize what the what the proper context of those things, you know is and, and and utilize that in the best sense possible. Well, John, thank you so much for this time. I we want to respect your time. I know you're busy. Um, appreciate everything you shared. I mean, goodness, there's so many things we could talk with you about. I definitely want to have you on again. We want to, I really want to bridge into um, talking to you about history and the teaching sure. history in a classical school, because I know that's your wheelhouse there. Um, Before, in our closing, what I would love for you to share real quick is um, what book do you wish you had read early on in your teaching career? And then we'll close with that. Oh, that's a good question. Um, uh, I would probably say probably Ideas Have Consequences um, by by Weaver. Um, I think, I mean, I read that um, – my gosh, I think I was probably in my second year of my master's program. Uh, about when I read that, it was ah, all these things that I've kind of or I've had tangential understanding. Um, and he was he was calling these things out decades ago. Um, and I think that uh, I think that that's important um, in the grand scheme of things. So I, Richard Weaver's "Ideas Have Consequences" is a good one. Um, "Hold On to Your Kids" is another one um, that I read. Um, I'd been in campus leadership for five years, and uh, "Hold On to Your Kids" is about the 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 idea that our children are being formed by their peer groups and not by their families. Mm. Um, and that we could have a whole discussion about that because that is the, that is a key thing that something terrible happens between fourth grade and seventh grade where parents become obsolete. They become stupid and 
what becomes important is the kid's best friend. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very dangerous cocktail in today's world. All right. Thank you so much, John. We will definitely be having you on again. Appreciate Thank your you. time. Thank you. Thank you both. Have a good day. Thanks, John. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. We invite you to experience the art of teaching through interactive learning communities at our Patreon page. Visit patreon.com forward slash classical education. Also, be sure to join the conversation on our Facebook community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. We are a listener supported podcast, so your support makes this podcast possible. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once wrote, well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be in a few words this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know best of all what it is to behave under it as in the presence of a father who is in heaven.